Hello, I'm apx 3 cam welcome back to the second channel, Geography Video. This is the episode series where I talk about geography and the world and stuff. And today, I want to talk about shrinking countries, at least in terms of land area, because there are three major ways that countries get compared and measured against each other, and it usually comes down to the population of a country, you know, the number of people that live there, the GDP of a country, the size of its economy, the value of its goods produced, and finally, the land area of a country. These three factors kind of determine the influence and importance that a country tends to have, and therefore, they're pretty important factors to measure and keep an eye on, and one of the interesting things about these three factors is that the first two things always tend to go up over time, and will go up over the next 5, 10, or 100 years. The amount of people living on Earth is going to go up, so if the average population per country is going to go up, the economy of the Earth is likely going to go up over the next 5, or 10, or 100 years as well. However, the average size of a country is not going to go up over the next 5 or 10 years, because every single piece of habitable land on Earth has either been claimed, or has a, you know, kind of let's all not claim it together agreement, like you'll see with Antarctica, um, but Basically, the amount of land that countries can have can't necessarily go up, and in fact, it's likely to go down. The average size of a country will be lower in 5 or 10 or 100 years, barring extraordinary circumstances, and I want to talk about all the reasons that's going to be true by talking about countries very likely to shrink, or that are in the process of shrinking as we speak. So, yeah, hopefully you'll enjoy it, but let's start by talking about a country that is shrinking right now. That's right, as you watch this video, a country is very, very gradually sinking, uh, because uh, obviously the sea level of the Earth is rising, whatever reason you want to believe that's for. The average, you know, sea level is rising, and some countries suffer a lot more than that for others. Because obviously, any country of a coast is going to see some of its coastal areas slowly fade away into the ocean. Um, you know, there's the example of like the house that's built on a cliff in England, for instance. But there's also uh, examples of stuff like, oh yeah, the Maldives. So the Maldives is a country of about a thousand islands. It's a collection of islands, and you know how I said it was really tricky to imagine, like, oh yeah, imagine if you're, you know, part of a country that's two separate main islands. This is a country of about a thousand one hundred islands. There's a lot of islands in the Maldives, and uh, only about 400,000 people that share them. So they're their own ethnic group and they had like this whole British Empire thing. But the important thing about it in terms of shrinking countries is the fact that the whole country is built on very low lying islands. So the average population, the bulk of their population, lives on uh, you know parts of the island which are about 1.2 meters above sea level. And you can probably see where that's going wrong because even the highest point in their country is only about 2.4 meters above the sea level. So to convert that for freedom units, if you live in America, that's something like six donkey heads or about 12 uh, cracker barrels, so just keep that in mind. Uh, <laughs> useful little conversion view. But no, uh, let's talk about uh, you know why why that is. Obviously, they're just a country which is formed of lots and lots of different uh, islands and uh, uh, atolls. And in case, by the way, you think like you know I I've heard of the Maldives, but I'm not quite sure where. One of the things that you've definitely heard of them from, one of the things that's definitely come up, is the fact that they actually have a lot of like the world's most iconic views. So uh, for instance, again, even if you've never heard of the Maldives and you're like no toy cat, you can't convince me otherwise. Let me show you something that will make you go, oh yeah, I've seen that on a screensaver somewhere because, uh, you know, these water bungalows are one of the famous things about it. It's a very expensive and luxurious, but therefore well photographed place in the world because, I mean, like, again, this this view, everyone's seen it, the beaches, it's just a, it's a country that lots of, uh, that has a lot of tourism for reasons you might expect. However, all of that tourism might go away when the country itself goes away in the next 50 to 100 years because, again, like I said, the sea level is rising faster than one meter per ever and because of that, right now even, a lot of low-lying areas of the country are slowly being evacuated on the islands that are higher, but within a hundred years, the whole country will stop having any physical land territory. And that is such a weird thing for, again, their own people group, their own 400,000 group people are going to have to work out somewhere else to live. And uh, the UN is even going to see it as the first example of a digital only country, because obviously you can't set up a digital country. It doesn't make sense. But after your country loses its land area, should you still exist as a country? And the current consensus is like, hopefully, maybe questionably, but that's something that the Maldives is going to struggle with over the next hundred or so years. Again, 2100 is the current estimated date, but you know how these things are, like trying to measure 90 uh, you know, years or so in the future, is something that is kind of tricky. So just keep that in mind, the Maldives is one of the first countries that's going to be wiped off the map, and they actually have the lowest average elevation that isn't negative, uh, because the Netherlands is technically below sea level, but <laughs> again, they have dams to sort themselves, whereas when you're a bunch of islands, again, seriously, look at how many islands there are, it's hard to even measure a bunch of them. There's a bunch of private islands, there's a bunch of public islands, there's atolls, and basically, yeah, their country is going to be gone soon. And that's uh, that's an issue in terms of, uh, you know, if you want to have a bigger country, then it's, it helps if it doesn't go underwater. And again, it's a big tragedy that at some point we're going to deal with, but not right now. Uh, unlike things that we probably should deal with right now, which is countries being annexed by other countries. So this is the more classic example. It's less likely to happen, I'd like to believe at least, uh, in terms of wars in the 21st uh, century. However, uh, maybe if you're one of those guys who feels like there's a 
of war around the corner, then this is something that's going to happen pretty soon because a country can take another country's territory. So for instance, um, in the case of Ukraine, uh, there was the P uh, Crimean Peninsula. And there's a whole like debate on like, well, I mean, it was the Russians at one point and they gave it to Ukraine. And th there's a whole bunch of like, oh, I guess it's in the gray area more than just the black or the white. But it is something where I think the West as a whole has internationally said, you know, what? you shouldn't just take bits of other countries, especially, you know, it'd be fine if you were like, oh yeah, that's ours. So we'll have a good old thing. Whereas instead they had like a referendum that was uh, very illegally held, held and didn't, you know, meet, meet international standards for like, whatever. Basically, there was a part of, uh, you know, uh, Ukraine right here, which is now belonging to Russia. They've turned it into a huge military base, which was kind of there before. And uh, now they've just made it a part of Russia. So Russia got bigger in terms of population, in terms of size. And at the, you know, the other side of that is Ukraine got smaller. And this is something you could see, again, if there are ever major wars between countries where they actually do start going into violent arms against each other, one of the things you'll see is that countries take other bits of countries. This is, I mean, this this is a no-brainer for anyone, right? Like, like, oh yeah, guess what? Countries shrink and countries get bigger as they go through successive wars. And that's why the most successful empires are also some of the largest ones. So when the British Empire was large, it covered a quarter of the Atlanta area because when you control the world seas, you can do that sort of thing. And the same sort of thing happened with Germany. It was a lot bigger uh, in World War II because it just kind of took a lot of Europe. And the same thing could happen in any future war. But I think, again, that kind of goes without saying. So we'll move on to the third way, which is more of an interesting way to lose land area from within because uh, countries seceding is something which is becoming more and more likely. So, uh, you know, the most ex uh, recent examples of this are Sudan with South Sudan, which is internationally recognized, so we can talk about it, and we won't get any Kosovo or Serbia comments down below, which is, I mean, that's a nice relief if you ask me. But yeah, we can <laughs> uh, we can talk about South Sudan because uh, it's the most recent example of a country seceding from another country, and therefore Sudan lost some area, and South Sudan gained some area because it went from not existing to existing with a lot of Sudan's old territory. So, again, there were some wars in, or like some battles or some conflicts, at least in relation to Sudan and South Sudan, but they have a referendum. They decide to be like, yep, we'll be our own country. And again, from Sudan's perspective, they lost some land area. And this is something likely to happen with more and more countries because again, the trend is for the number of countries, the amount of division to go up in the world. There's a lot of benefits to being a small country in 2018, at least. Uh, you know, again, maybe not if that whole war thing happens, but assuming there are no major wars, there's a big, big, big uh, boatload of benefits that comes from being an independent country. And that's why you see a bunch of examples around the world, such as Scotland, which is uh, probably one of the countries which is closest to the brink of independence in terms of both legally and in terms of support, again, I mean, uh, just in terms of the, the world, uh, Catalonia is another famous example coming up a lot. Again, the independence on that one is whole, uh, it's its whole issue as well. But lots of countries have little areas that are trying to go independent and that could go independent within the next uh, 100 years. And I think the big, biggest example that I want to mention is actually Denmark and Greenland. So again, uh, sorry if you're Danish, I love Denmark and I've never been to Greenland, but I'm sure even if you're Danish, you can admit that like, even though Denmark owns Greenland, which it does, fun fact, uh, but even though, you know, Greenland is a possession of Denmark, there, there isn't really a huge link between them. In the same way the UK doesn't have the hugest link with the British Indian Ocean Territory. You know, it's not something we're all thinking about every single day. Uh, there, <laughs> or, uh, you know, we don't have the, the biggest links between the South Georgia Islands over here. There's, there's a bunch of examples, oh, like, over here. There's a bunch of examples of territories where it's like, you know what, there isn't a huge link between them, and if they have their own native population, like Greenland does, it leads to the likelihood of independence going very high. So, the only reason Greenland isn't independent right now, even though they have a majority separatist party in their parliament, which, by the way, their parliament has 23 seats, it's really cute, you should look into it sometime, um, but they have a majority of people there that want to independence, at least right now, and that could change over the next, you know, 50 or 100 years, uh, because the big uh, kind of thing is, they don't want to be independent yet, because Denmark gives them a a lot of money. It's something like 400 million krona a year. They just send over there and they're like, yeah, you can spend it. And in exchange, we keep using your country as a military base. But the thing is, Greenland will eventually become independent especially because of all the oil money that is related to being uh, this country up here, and especially as the country falls and becomes more usable and becomes more of its own thing. Uh, they've even recently had, uh, you know, they had a big referendum recently to have their own home rule bill, and now they use Greenlandic as their own language, they have their own police and coast force, and basically they're moving towards country every year, and even Denmark is just like, why are we giving money to someone that's using it to fuel their own independence thing? And that's something you're going to see happen at some point in the next 100 years, and the reason I mention this example so prominently is because Greenland accounts for something like like 97 to 98% of 
Denmark's uh, overall uh, land area. So Denmark is going to shrink, technically speaking, by about 95 to 98%, which is a crazy amount for a country to shrink. And although most of it's technical, because like, I mean, even though Greenland's big, I mean, like, is this area right here usable? You know, this big white screen you can see? Not really. Anyway, so with that said, let's talk about another way that countries can shrink, because obviously you're going to see uh, all of these examples, like, well, maybe a war happens, maybe a country secedes, or maybe uh, the ocean levels rise. But the uh, the, the biggest way in, that's confusing in a way is, um, um, you know, when it comes to countries with natural borders that shift. So there are two ways that countries can do borders along a natural uh, you know, a point such as a, a river or such as a mountain range. You can accept that the mountain range will change and that therefore the border will change too. Or you can try and keep the old borders even though it covers new land now. So a lot of US states choose the uh, the second one, which is terrible for that sort of thing. But a lot of countries, especially you know Germany for instance, use the natural border of the river as the border between say Germany and Poland. So the Oder and the Nice rivers are the two big borders that separate Germany from Poland. And over the next hundred years, they're likely going to change a little bit. There's going to be some, uh, you know, like the Oder rivers going to go a little bit further into Poland or a little bit further into Germany and they're always losing and gaining minor amounts of territory in that way and it's not the biggest of deals because again if you live on one side of the river you don't really see it as new land or if the river goes that way you have more land but do you really see it that way and again maybe if rivers start changing massively and maybe in the next thousand years there'll be some big notable changes but for now it's just like a at all the time, always, there is subtle changes happening with rivers. Again, this is like what you learn in like real geography class in school. They're like, oh yeah, there's like, because, uh, you know, rivers are trying to find the fastest path to the end point that they're going to. And because of that, they tend to have some weird uh, path diversions that lead to interesting situations, such as uh, the big dispute, by the way between uh, Serbia and Croatia, where you can see, again, their stick Serbia and Croatia have a disagreement as to whether the current river stands or the old river border stands. And it means you have this situation where like, ah, oh, that's Croatian land right there on the Serbian side of the river. That's some Serbian land on the Croatian side. And uh, there's actually a micro country that's set up here. It's called Liberland. It's Libertarian Paradise. Go live there if you want to live in Libertarian Paradise. But in case you don't, let's talk about the next way that countries uh, kind of tend to lose that land. And that is by land swapping. So again, the, the most likely contender in like, again, the far, far future is, uh, you know, this example right here between Belgium and the Netherlands. I don't think they would ever fully exchange because it's kind of like a tourist attraction, but there are a few weird ones here where, like, the two countries will probably agree. At some point, they're like, you know what? Having a bit of Belgium inside the Netherlands that's this big, literally this big, probably not very efficient. Oh, <laughs> uh, but it, it mostly comes down to the lords that used to live there because, again, this used to be private land where, like, oh, yeah, this was a Belgian man's land and this was a, uh, you know, Dutch man's land and this was a Belgian man's land and so on and so forth. Bunch of wood examples. I think stuff like this is slowly being cleared up over time. And the biggest example that I used to be able to mention was India. So India and Bangladesh, uh, they have one of the world's messiest borders um, because, I mean, it goes back to, like, the Mughal Empire. And, like, if you look into it, it's just like, oh, yeah, so they had a, they had a huge war, you know, the former people there and uh, they mostly sorted it out, but they never really agreed who owned what territory. So yeah, nowadays, if you look at the Bangladesh-India border, you can see how it looks like it has a bunch of enclaves and exclaves, but almost all of them, besides the very biggest, have now been sorted. So again, even though their border is messy today, let me show you what their border looked like three years ago. So this is a 2015 classic IBX 2 cat. Can you call it, can you call yourself classic? Uh, as you can see, if you look at this video, this exact same place right here is filled with enclaves and exclaves. There is parts of Bangladesh inside India, there's parts of India inside Bangladesh, there's parts of India and <laughs> there's parts of Bangladesh inside India, inside, sorry, sorry, India inside Bangladesh, inside uh, India as a whole, and it had the world's only, uh, you know, to this day, a third order exclave. There was a part of Bangladesh inside India, inside Bangladesh, inside India. It's the most insane thing that you can have so many layers around a country, and it was a thing that happened with the two countries' borders, which, again, it's such a messy one, uh, even to this day, but they mostly agreed to swap land area, and India lost the tiniest bit of land, and Bangladesh gained, gained some. So, Bangladesh is bigger than it was five years ago, and India is smaller than it was five years ago, and that is a result of uh, border things. And we'll see the same thing when eventually India, Pakistan, China, and all this stuff just decide to eventually work out their borders, but for now, we just have this big question mark, question, like, seriously, uh, the craziest thing about these under borders is the fact that this one right here, even the claim that India has, uh, sorry, the claim that Pakistan has, is just like, you know, it goes somewhere over here, and uh, beyond that, it's, uh, we'll, we'll work that out later. So yeah, weird stuff going on in the mountains over here in Jammu and Kish Kashmir, which will eventually mean that India will get bigger and Pakistan will get smaller, or that Pakistan will get bigger and India will get smaller one more time. So there you go. That's the uh, way like there. And there's one more way this can happen. You might be thinking like, that's a lot of shrinking countries, Toy Cat. Like India just shrank, uh, you know, like slowly over time, uh, you know, like um, it looks like eventually again. The major beneficiary or the loser of this is going to be Serbia. So Serbia is shrinking in that way. Uh, Serbia 
Serbia is shrinking in that way that we're not going to talk about. I didn't say it. I didn't say their name. It's, it's fine. You leave the comments alone, Serbians. <laughs> I swear, that, that's like the one... Whenever you're talking geography, there's going to be like a, an army of Serbians that are like, Kosovo is Serbia. And it's like, whoa, we get, we get your opinion. And actually, to kind of back up, because I, I know like a lot of the international world is like, oh yeah, Kosovo, definitely its own country. And Serbians are like, how can you just say that? Like, the, it breaks a lot of international laws. And it actually kind of does. And the interesting example is that if you admit Kosovo is real, to some extent, you have to admit that the two Georgian regions of uh, Abskazia and South Ossetia, uh, these two countries right here. Again, they're not officially recognized by the UN, and they're only recognized by about six countries worldwide. But there are two other countries which are semi-real uh, in the form of, again, Abkhazia and of South Ossetia. So South Ossetia is part of a two-part region. There's a North Ossetia, which is in uh, you know, Russia, of course, and uh, you know, Abkhazia is its own thing right here. And the reason these countries are kind of countries is because in the same way as Kosovo, they wanted to be independent. They have their own people group, so they just decided to be independent one day. However, the whole world recognizes them as being Georgia, you know, claimed, and it, it it's a messy thing, but the reason I bring these up is not just because, ah, look at Georgia, it's its own thing, or like, ah, yeah, it's kind of like the Kosovo thing, right? But I bring it up because, one, it's like an interesting example of hypocrisy, and two, because Russia is abusing that potential hypocrisy to get slightly more land area for one of these countries. So Georgia is shrinking every single uh, year, or like even more frequently than that sometimes, because of something called borderization. So this is something I don't think that has ever happened in the world before uh, Georgia. Yeah, again, maybe it has uh, you know, happened on a more serious scale, but Georgia is shrinking by a few hundred meters every few months or so. And the reason that's happening is because South Ossetia and Abkhazia used to be, uh, you know, regions of, uh, you know, uh, region, they were like official autonomous uh, SSRs within the Soviet Union. So they had their own, like, rights guaranteed. And even though they were trampled a little bit, they were like, you know, what? now that we're under Georgia instead of the USSR, we'll be trampled even more probably. So they went independent and they have Russia's backing. So, uh, you know, again, Georgia never really goes there because Russia, you know, makes a whole war of it than they do. So because Russia has effective control or effective uh, power over these things, and they're one of the few countries that recognize them, uh, Russian troops go in to support them, and they allow them to do very weird things, such as moving the border forwards a few hundred meters every now and then. So this is called borderization, and um, it's something that's happened with, uh, you know, uh, the George territory, because as you can see, uh, it's just whatever, my point being is you can see how the border sign has been moved, and every, you know, every few uh, years or months, they just move the border a few, uh, forwards a few hundred meters, and because the border isn't officially agreed between countries, again, it's a very unofficial border, when it moves forwards a few hundred meters, what do you do? It's an unofficial border regardless, and therefore Georgia, again, eventually will, uh, you know, probably admit these countries are real, again, I don't know when, I don't know how, but if that do does ever happen, then when they, they'll have to admit on some form of border, and that border that is unofficially happening is slowly moving forwards. And again, it's such a complex situation that like, oh, so Georgia owns this territory, right? Well, Georgia doesn't own it, but in the international community's eyes, they do. So they don't agree with the government that's in control and the government is taking land from them. So what's the solution? You might say, oh yeah, Georgia, uh, you know, as a part of Georgia is going independent, but they don't recognize that. They should send in the army to go and take it back. Like you can't just take a bit of the bigger country you're in, right? Well, what if the other country has backing from Russia, and every time you try to do that, Russia invades you. Well, that leads to the weird situation, which is Georgia and the shrinking country. So yeah, I feel bad for Georgia, and uh, <laughs> I think we all should a little bit too, but it's also the interesting example of like, you know what, if you, uh, it is a, like, kind of, not, again, I, I, I don't like the word hypocrisy too much, but it is kind of like a, an interesting double standard where, like, there is a lot of similarities between Abkhazia and, uh, you can say Abkhazia, I think, by the way, and, and Kosovo, but the interesting thing about it is that in one of those cases, uh, you know, there is a borderization happening, a slow creep forward, and uh, that's because it's not being internationally recognized. The same thing could happen if Kosovo wasn't internationally recognized and Serbia didn't recognize them too. They could just move the border forwards a little bit, and who would mind you, right? You know, as long as they have a powerful Western ally. And that's why I think recognizing these weird rump state countries, there's a bunch of other examples. Um, you know, this part of uh, Armenia is one. Uh, there's Transnistria and Moldova. There's a bunch of other weird countries that will lead to the same situation if you don't recognize them, where you don't have any real effective international power because they're not an international unit. They're just a thing that exists in your territory. But anyway, that's, uh, that's an interesting example that I'd love to talk about some more in uh, a future Georgia video, perhaps, because I do intend to do another Borders with Toy Cat video. It's been uh, quite some time, but I do intend to do another one probably in the next uh, week or two. So I guess look forward to that or something. But anyway, hope you all enjoyed today's video. Uh, and as always, second channel, don't care. Oh, no, wait, do care because check out the links down below to the subreddit and also to um, 
to the link where you can do the thing that I mentioned before, where you sign up and the ad revenue, the amount you, that you split, is split between every website you watch. It's a good solution to the world as a whole. Anyway, just, I'll leave two links down below. Check them out. Goodbye. Oh wait, second channel. Don't care.